Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. <laughs> so we are going to talk to you about raising children in sovereignty. Well, we're just going to have a chat because um, Lainey and I love a chat. Okay, and we love so now it says we're like... Sovereignty <laughs> and autonomy. We are going to talk to you oh. about... Well, we're getting a bit of feedback. Are you getting yeah, that? Is that on that's, your side? That's from me. Sorry about that. So sorry. So if you're watching... Say hello because we like talking to other humans. Yep, we are showing it's being live on my page, so that's really cool. Um, I've got a lot of new Facebook friends um, who might not know me. So for those of you who don't know who we are, um, Lainey and I met probably like a year and a half ago in person in Spain. Lainey runs... Um, Project World School Family Summits and Project World School Teen Retreats in locations around the world. And so I met her in Granada, Spain, in a retreat, uh, a summit that she was running there. Um, and I went with my family. And that's where we met. Um, Lainey's been world schooling and um, travelling around the world with her son, Miro, who's now a fully fledged grown up um for about tw like were you guys traveling for about 12 years yeah it we left um the united states for our journey uh i guess summer of 2009 so however long that has been <sighs> yeah that's that's like 11 or 12 years 12 13 years 13 years um yeah so laney laney and i both um describe ourselves as unschoolers um pretty pretty radical unschoolers and depending on where you live in the world you use different terms for different things i'm learning um but that's kind of a generally known term basically means that we live with our children in autonomy and freedom and no one is like above anyone else um you know, someone sometimes maybe needs to steer the ship. Certainly that's the case in my family because there's four children. Um, but we make decisions uh, more collaboratively than what many families, I guess, do. And so what that has meant for us over quite a few years is developing really close connections um, with each other. And that becomes the, the rudder, really, like the basis for everything as opposed to rules and boundaries in the conventional sense as most families talk about them. right and I... for for us we set out with the intention 12 13 years ago however many years ago that was to be in partnership and that was the paradigm and the mindset that we approached this whole thing from and partnership i had never even heard of partnership parenting and in fact i know we didn't coin the phrase somebody oh, must i think it. i think we made it up i'm saying we it's out <laughs> well i've it's always been market. saying that <laughs> Where we are, you know, I, I parent in partnership with my child. So like I've always said that, but I, somebody somewhere must have said, you know, partnership parenting is a thing. But for me, it made the most sense. It really made the most sense. And, and as an extension of um, the attachment parenting, yes, there are different roles that each one of us play within the the paradigm of the family right um it's okay it just doesn't mean one role has authority over another role and that to me was really at the foundation of partnership and through that that became a really internal and external exploration of what partnership means partnership what does that mean in relationship to sovereignty to autonomy to agency i think they're all synonym or or, or uh what's the word yeah synonyms of the same thing right uh with with slight variations but what does it mean to really honor 
sovereignty within self and within the other people in relationship in your family. And this is taking us into a deep dive. And there's like, if you think of it as a circle, there's like all these different spokes. Yes, we could talk about consent. Yes, we can talk about guidance. Yes, we can talk about needs, right? Because we all have different needs. Um, we could talk about the balancing of all these different things, but in essence, sovereignty or the respect of sovereignty is at the root of creating a strong family culture. Now, I discovered this through need because we were traveling and all the ways of doing things before as we did before didn't make sense like we didn't have schedules we didn't have like responsibilities we didn't have agendas we chose to step into a life of what we called freedom and with that it just meant being in relationship very differently and that just because travel was my vehicle to get me there it doesn't mean it has to be yours it you know it could be anything right so use my experience and sarah's experience as as sort of a jumping off board to see where the similarities are but your situation is going to look very different so i just yeah so we had um, a really interesting conversation actually this morning in our in our house just with one or two children in particular and there's there's two children in our family at the moment who are hanging out together more than anyone else and naturally when you're talking about sibling relationships that also means they're fighting a lot more than anybody else in the family because they are dancing around the autonomy of another and in sibling relationships it's really common that that that, I mean, the way it manifests, the way we observe it as parents is in, is as conflict. So you've got one child who wants um, a particular Lego piece and another child who wants the same Lego piece and both of them, you know, um, are, are very focused on their own needs as an individual. And so the conversation we had was around the fact that, yeah, the person who was holding on to the Lego piece can keep holding on to the Lego piece. Like that's, they can, they can perceive that that's their right to keep the Lego piece. Um, maybe they got it as a present. I can't remember the details of the conflict, but maybe that it, maybe they felt some like level of ownership over that Lego piece. And so they felt an entitlement to that Lego piece and they were like really defending their right to have that Lego piece. And the other child perceived that they had an equal right to that Lego piece. And both of them were trying to really um, impose consequences on each other not natural consequences because natural consequences aren't imposed but actually impose you know in, a, in in order to manipulate the other one to do what they wanted so they were really both trying to force their will onto another person and this is the theme of the conflicts in most families particularly as it relates to siblings one person wants to do this thing and they will impose their will on another person and the other person is equally committed to their own will and so we had this conversation about, about how that works in a, in a family or, in fact, in community when one person wants to force their will on another person. And the fact that as an individual, sure, you've got a right to do really whatever you want to do. You can. You can do whatever you want to do. If you want to, like, scream really loudly, you can scream really loudly. No one can stop you from doing that. No one can control your voice. Screaming is a bit of a thing with these two particular children. <laughs> so most conflicts end with some kind of screaming. Um, and, and the person who's screaming can scream. No one can stop them from screaming. You physically can't really stop another person from screaming. Um, but the person who's on the receiving end of that then has a choice about what they want to do. So they can't stop the, the sibling from screaming and reacting the way they're reacting. They really can't. Um, and if that person is determined to continue screaming, they're going to keep screaming. And the other person can then choose what they do with that. And this is about where the edges, you know, in a family, we're all kind of dancing balls almost, mm -hmm. I imagine. And, and we're all like just touching up against each other. And, and so one person just bumps up against the other and it naturally has an impact. And then this person gets to choose, well, what am I going to do with that? Um, and that's really the essence of, of autonomy, that everyone actually has a choice. Everyone can choose what they do. Um, 
and really when you own yourself you can you can literally do whatever you want to do but you can't then choose how the other person reacts to that because they will they'll, there'll be a consequence and a reaction and and that's their that's their stuff you know so it's just this um it's just this constant dance and yeah it's um it's just it's just really interesting to observe particularly in a family with among siblings how they really practice that in a pretty safe environment because they they do know that they're always going to be there for each other so it's a really safe place to try out these skills and test out the weight of their sovereignty what does that mean when i do something what's that mean for the other person and how do we navigate that yeah and with with the story that you just shared there is so much to unpack there right because if Yes, I'm going to totally emphasize that security and safety is part of creating a space of sovereignty. That is the foundation, right? There, everybody's got to feel safe in exploring how they bump up against one another because being in relationship with one another is part of the, um, you know, part of the the expression of sovereignty. Like you can't just be sovereign and go off and be by yourself. Like. Mm. Oh, Okay, I mean, I guess you can, but that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about really owning our sovereignty within the dynamics of a family. And the other thing that was unspoken that you didn't say, which like messes with parents' heads, if indeed we do buy into this idea of sovereignty within our family dynamic, we then are imposing our agenda of peace upon our children. And when they're fighting, it makes us uncomfortable. And when they're mm -hmm. expressing and bumping up against each other and really negotiating what that looks like, all some parents, <laughs> me included, can see can yeah. get triggered by that, you know, that that witnessing of the thing that makes us uncomfortable. And then we impose our agenda, like be peaceful, figure it out. Like we're trying to interject into their process. And mm. guess what? That's not sovereignty either. So yeah, there's a it's lot uh, to unpack. Yeah. So so to go back you know, like to really understand this idea of sovereignty and 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 how we then can relate with our children. I, yeah. Like I, we need to go right back to, and I often talk about with, with parents, this, I, this um, what happens when we're pregnant, for example, like you remember being pregnant, right? Like we've talked about pregnancy and birth before, <laughs> yeah. right? So you're pregnant, this is a typical situation. It's not necessarily mine, but I know this is what, what's pretty typical for, I would say the majority of women. You get pregnant, you're super excited, you go for a checkout, check out, check up with someone, doctor, midwife, obstetrician, hospital, whatever. And not very far into your pregnancy, you start getting um, checked and measured, your confidence gets undermined, you get sent off for tests. Um, often tests that aren't actually um, indicated because of any risk factors but just because they're standard practice and by the time you have you're ready to birth that baby you've already had your confidence as a mother as a sovereign being eroded you've already been told that you're not capable that you need help that your baby doesn't know what they're doing either and so you go into that birth um not feeling like a confident birthing warrior woman who knows what she's about with her ancestors on her side, with the collective energy and wisdom of all the women who've birthed before her, as we should be going into, into birth as, but as, as a woman who has become a shriveled version of herself, who's got to ask for, for permission, yep. who's got to strongly advocate for herself if, if she's even capable by that point of doing that. And then births a baby into this world where she's just from then on constantly undermined and having her intuition um, eroded by other people. And that's how we start our parenting life. Yeah, I already really not feeling like we're sovereign beings. Yeah. I remember birthing Miro in the hospital. And I remember finally after these 40 hours of labor, 
he finally came out and the doctor took him. And I remember putting my arms out and screaming, give him to me, give him to me. Like that voice inside of me, mm -hmm. you know, I'm still like in the stirrups and give him to me. Like I was adamant and you know, that, that probably wasn't my voice. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a part of my voice that was connected to the ancestors and all that stuff. But the, the procedure of giving birth really, really took that power from me because I had to do it in a clinical environment, you know, even though it was oh, well, it becomes a procedure. Imagine like I'm exactly. reducing birth to like a clinical procedure. So then as a parent, when we're navigating these situations with our children yeah. and they're telling us they want to be autonomous and they're telling us constantly um, that they want to stand in their own power, but if we haven't felt that power, probably we weren't raised that way and then we have a chance to transform into parenthood and that is even taken away from us often. Yeah. So to get to a point where we can be sovereign in order to hold our children in their sovereignty, like that's the work, that takes work. Yeah. You know, there's not that many of us who get to parenthood already like ready standing there like, yes, you know, there's not very many of us really. We've, we've got to work for it. This is so true. So I would like to give you a couple of tools that will help you move towards greater sovereignty. And, um, you know, we, we like to frame it within the, the context of partnership, right? So what does partnership look like? And how do you negotiate partnership? If in a partnership it's equal, equal say, um, then you've got to talk about how everybody can get their voice heard within within the context of your family dynamic and we, we actually go into that quite a bit when we talk about developing your family culture and ditching the rules and all that stuff and that's really important to look at and i just want to drop that pin and introduce you to that as a concept now but we're not really going to get way into designing your family culture but the second but that is an important tool and if if you'd like to swing back around with us on that topic later we're totally happy to do that but the second tool that you're going to have to really get familiar with is the tool of consent. What does consent look like? How does, and consent is a multifaceted um, relationship because it's the person giving consent to another person. It's the person, um, if the consent is about me taking from that person, then there's a relationship of that person having to give, right? And they have to consent to that. If it's giving consent for another person to take from me or touch me or, you know, do something to me, then it's it's an, a different kind of relationship. But all of the different facets of consent are super important to be aware of and to look at here. You can't just um, you know, go up and tickle your kid because you think, you know, they look like they need to be tickled and it would be fun. You know, it's their body. Even though you have the desire to do that, it doesn't outweigh their desire to say yes or no. You know, I don't want to be tickled or yes, I do want to be tickled. There's, there's this element of give and take and respect that is partnership that goes between the two people. So it's, but consent is not always just a physical touch thing, but we think of it first to wrap around, you know, to wrap our heads around it as a body bo bodily autonomy and within bodily autonomy, means that you have the ability to activate consent or um, take away consent. So that's a great way of thinking about it just to get yourself from familiar with the concept of consent and how that works within a family dynamic. But consent actually goes so much deeper. It's not 
about only body or personal space. It's about not just intention, but it's about imposition. It's about expectations. It's about demands. And, you know, giving that kind, like, you must, uh, you know, clean your room could be a demand. And there might be a bodily portion to that. But the lingering guilt and the, the lingering expectations and the lingering agenda is not something that the child consented to, right? They didn't say, you can guilt me into cleaning my room. Like that is part of the nature of talking about consent too. It's not just the one thing, but the the intro to the topic itself, it's, you know, it's, it's a great way to wrap your head around it. <laughs> so I'll hand it so over to you. Easy to talk, it's easy to talk about um, or easier when you're talking about my body, your body. That's yeah. like, I mean, even that I think for a lot of parents isn't black and white, but it re- and it requires really, you know, radical honesty about what I have ownership for and what you have ownership for and what really right. impacts on other people and what doesn't. Again, it, it's this, it's like where we rub up against other people and we, and we have to be really honest about it. And our kids are great at this because they naturally want to hold us accountable for, for their own autonomy too. Like they are, this is this, this is, I, w- I would say that the majority of conflict in families, particularly when children are little, uh, is around autonomy and it's around consent and it's around children saying, no, I don't want to do that. No, you can't do that to me. And parents thinking that they know better or that children don't understand enough and so they need to be guided which is kind of code for manipulated and coerced often. And it's actually a really great place for children to um, start understanding where these edges kind of rub up against the edges of somebody else's autonomy and feeling the weight of some of those consequences that we kind of assume as parents, kids aren't capable of holding, but they're actually capable of holding way more than we give them credit for. Like, you know, it's a pretty it's a pretty common thing to hear parents saying to a child, "Oh, you should put your coat on because it's cold," for example. <laughs> you know, and the child doesn't want to bring their coat, and then the parents like, "No, you've got to have your coat on. It's cold outside." And the kid doesn't, and it goes on and on and on. So the the, the parent assumes that the child doesn't have all of the information they need to make that decision. The child's not capable of making it about how their own body feels. And further to that, we also assume that they don't have the foresight. And we also assume that we understand exactly how their body feels. And even like, well, I'm cold, therefore they must be cold. And often kids have a totally different perception of all of that stuff to us anyway. Yeah. So I typically, like if we go for a walk, for example, I would typically feel colder than my children. Like they move differently too. And we've forgotten that as well. Like they're constantly fidgeting and moving. They're not just like walking up and down and running and jumping. And, you know, so they are naturally like feeling that their blood is probably pumping quicker than ours. And we've forgotten because we're just like moseying along. So not only do we think they don't know their own body, but we layer our own stuff on top. Exactly. Of theirs. I mean, that's just one, that's just like a really simple example. But like if we don't allow children to feel the weight of those decisions when they're young, they they potentially don't learn them or they have to relearn them as adults. Yeah. As many of us did. And I have to tell you, Sarah, like my son is 22 and he was just recently here and we went out one night and I went back, we were like leaving our apartments um, and I went back and I was like, I'm going to go grab a sweater. He's like, and I said to him, why don't you go, ra- go grab a sweater? And I went into my house and I grabbed a sweater and it came out and he didn't grab a sweater. And I was like, why didn't you grab a sweater? And he's like, mom, I know my body. I don't need a sweater. And I just was like, ah. no. so, you know, even, even if 
our heart is in the right place and we believe that we're being kind and supportive, we are, we do bump up against them when we constantly, I still get these reminders that I have an agenda. Perhaps my agenda is to keep them alive. And, you know, obviously, you know, it's, it's a good hearted agenda as all parents have, right? But we need to really take a deep breath and be aware when our agenda is not allowing them to have yeah. the experience of self-regulation. And children that don't learn how to self-regulate their bodies, their, their emotions, or even their thoughts, um, they, they tend to have a, a, you know, a more difficult time in adulthood. And that, that little exchange that I had with Miro <laughs> standing outside of both of our doors made me giggle. It just made me remind myself that, yeah, I still have work to do and I still fall into these traps. And yeah, yeah, thank God it feels so good to be human, you know. So let's talk about what happens then. Our children get older and having the benefit of like many years of living with our children and being able to like pour our immense wisdom into them. <laughs> then they start disagreeing with us and having different opinions. I've got my 13-year-old just over here. <laughs> but she's completely free to disagree with me. Yeah. Right? Do you agree? <laughs> Um, but but there's a there's a um, I notice this and this is why I'm going to say it I'm going to kind of call it out right there's this um, I notice a, a pattern really particularly in like natural parenting conscious parenting circles that there's an expectation that we that our children are this product of us and a reflection of us and we do all of this stuff. And then they kind of come out the other end, um, you know, loving, I don't know, knitting and um, organic smoothies and uh, <laughs> not gaming, <laughs> painting <I failed. laughs> in the woods, you know, like, but, but like there's this, there's this idea that like we give all the good, we give them all of this stuff and all of this good stuff and we like set an example and we're role models, modelling, modelling behaviour, modelling what you want to see. And then one day your child disagrees with you or they're like, but I actually really want a phone or I want to spend a lot of time gaming or I don't really like nature <laughs> and I want to drink Coke. And or I my politics. Or my politics, my politics is, different. is different to you. I don't agree. Yeah, that's right. And that is that is not only the ultimate like show of sovereignty in a child, but it's also the ultimate test <laughs> for us about sure. whether we really mean what we say. Do we really mean what we say? We want our children to be sovereign, autonomous, independent, free thinking individuals. And we've got to then accept that they're not always going to agree with us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I've had that experience so many times, like, you know, watching my trigger responses go off because I just want to get him to understand, you know, a particular right. perspective. But it's, <laughs> I've already given him the information. So whether, Jody, whether Jody's watching and she said, or I want to go to school like a normal kid. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right right you know that's it it just it just is what it is and i think i think you're right sarah the um the act of giving this independence and and real um gift of autonomy means that they are our children are going to be their own people and we have to be prepared for that. We have to be embracing of that. We have to be welcoming of that. And I think it's to our benefit to take a deep breath and just listen and learn about their perspectives and honor it. I always say there's space in the world for so many perspectives, ideas, 
um, you know, ideologies, viewpoints, ethics, morals, whatever, to live side by side. They don't have to match. And that, that kind of diversity makes us rich, makes a, a tapestry of, of richness. And I don't think we can get that tapestry of richness in the sameness. So we don't really want our children to be the same as us. I want to grow in spaces that make me uncomfortable. And I want to honor their sovereignty in a way that was never honored inside of me. And so for me, that's part of healing my my family ancestral wounds. But who knows how far that goes back. I think it goes back pretty far in my family. Come from a a long line of controlling people. (laughs) So I think that that goes pretty far in my family lineage. But to me, it's the most triggering thing. It's the most um, difficult thing that I am committed to living and breathing through, right? So, you know, I often talk to parents of teens and that's where, you know, the primary um, uh, focus of my work is, is working with teens or sometimes with the parents, but mostly with the teens. But what I tell the parents of teens that are struggling is if they are struggling because their teen is rebelling, I say to them, congratulations, you have done a job well, very well, you know, job well done, job well done. We need free thinkers. The world needs free thinkers. We need those that are willing to push up against ideologies that don't align with that person. We need our youth to have voice. We need this. And whether or not it's it's in alignment with our own personal values doesn't matter. We need to just be able to, to have the space to talk about those things. So rebellion doesn't necessarily look like, you know, sneaking out of the house and doing things like that. But rebellion can be, you know, somebody who wants to go to school when you've raised them as an unschooler. That could be the ultimate rebellion. And that could very well trigger you. But guess what? You know, if you're creating space for your child to express their autonomy, then as Sarah said, they'll have the experience of natural yeah. consequences. And the, the spaces of safety that you've created are those spaces that help them mm. grow into. Yeah, and they'll you know, use that space. If there's yeah. space there, they'll use it like we want them to. I think this old idea that we're really starting to disrupt now that our children are kind of crafted in our image that's kind of pervaded parenting and still to some extent does um you know that's what we're talking about we're talking about really breaking down this idea that our children are like us that why would we want them to be like us and you know so many um even modern kind of parenting practices really are about behavior modification of the child which actually really equates to easier for me, less conflict, more convenient, um, and more like me, really. That's what that kind of means, more like me. And then we have this idea. And I'm just going to interject real fast, more like me, and me not accountable for my own triggers you're accountable for my triggers and that is not working (laughs) that's not part of partnership carry on i didn't mean to interrupt but i wanted to make sure i mean i I no no i agree no but i think it's really interesting like let's unpack it a little bit more and say it works if what you want to do is control your child right and push down your triggers so that you don't have to deal with them so it does work, which is why it's so tempting to go down that path of control and really um, not allowing space for sovereignty and autonomy in our children because actually it's hard work dealing with, like, independent <laughs> sovereign beings who know their own voice and they know themselves and they know what they stand for and they know their worth, and that's hard for us 
because they take half an hour to find a bloody pair of shoes, the exact right pair of shoes. They want the exact right drink bottle, even though you've got four others in your bag. They want just the right snack. They want like socks that don't rub on their little toes. So they have to keep trying till they find the exact right pair. They want to argue about who's sitting in the front seat and whose turn it is and who's going to have control of the music and who gets to hold the dog. And like, that's, that's what it looks like in practicality. So it's messy when you've got it to do because everyone's busy being bloody sovereign all at the same time. Yeah, it's messy. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. There's, there's a whole nother side of sovereignty that I like to talk about a lot. And okay, so we're taking it from sovereignty of body, sovereignty of self, sovereignty of actions. But I always invite parents and those that are interested in exploring sovereignty more is to internalize sovereignty and look at those baseline belief systems that were given to us through our own worldviews, our own indoctrination, our own culture, those things that are part of the way that we believe the world should run without ever questioning them, those belief systems are designed to not be uh, questioned. For me, the big one was my, I always believed my son needed to be educated. And I always believed that he needed to be educated by a professional who was um, capable of educating my child because God knows I wanted him to be educated. I didn't know what that was, but he needed it. He needed that thing, that, that thing. And so until I started questioning what that actually meant, it opened up this whole new way of looking at education, which led us down to the unschooling path. I didn't start the same way you did, Sarah. My son was just about 10 when we started approaching unschooling and you know natural learning and self-directed learning. Um, but that is just a small example from my world view and my belief system that I had to stick a, a stick of dynamite in and hit the plunger and blow up in order for me to find my own sovereignty within my own mind. And there, there are these big ideas and small ideas, big beliefs and small beliefs. But until we start unpacking what's inside that makes the world make sense to us in a way that makes sense, um, until we start unpacking those belief systems, we don't know what's in there and what's holding those things in place. So for me, it's really powerful to take sovereignty of thought as a big part of the um, equation of finding our own sovereignty, being accountable for that sovereign person that we bring into the partnership, and then honoring that in our families, uh, you know, our partners, our, our children, and so forth. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think the th that thing about education is interesting and there's so many other, um, you know, structures, the scaffolding of our society in general, that it's far easier. I mean, you didn't need to question what education meant when Miro was in school. No. Yeah. Because actually you were outsourcing that to someone else. So you can just go, oh, someone else is taking care of that. I don't really need to understand it. And that's kind of what we do when we hand over our power to all of these systems that 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 we believe support us. I mean, that's a large part of the kind of unlearning and deprogramming work that we do with parents and, and you do with teenagers around, oh, if I'm going to take responsibility for that thing now, education, healthcare, whatever it is, oh, I need to actually understand what that means. And, and so then you've got to like hold the weight of that in order to be fully responsible. And initially that can feel quite scary. You know, like, do you remember... I mean, maybe, maybe you don't, maybe this wasn't your experience, but I remember when our, two of our kids were at school and I wasn't worried really about the mechanics of learning. I knew they learned. I saw it all the time. What I was actually scared of was the fact that I was going to be held accountable for everything. 
and I knew it and I knew I was going to have to take that weight and I just had to be ready for it like and I had to kind of like almost just like take a deep breath and like okay yeah you know because I I knew I knew that they could let I I wasn't worried about any of that stuff but I knew that everybody else would be going oh that's her job now all of it and I had to be ready to take it and that feels really big particularly yeah. at the beginning it feels really big because it is that. if we're honest so much easier to just get someone else to do that and then you can go okay that's done tick that's I don't even have to think about it yeah so sovereignty isn't that. sovereignty isn't easy that's the point it's not easy because it's actually not nor it's not the norm I agree I never had the connection between learning and education. Education to me meant academics. Learning was something that your brain did automatically. But I also bought into the whole idea that children needed to be filled up with that information because somehow I believe that was important. I don't have those beliefs anymore. I looked at them, I unpacked them, I examined them, I tried to figure out where they came from. And I also looked at how those thoughts influenced my parenting before we started unschooling. And it was very, very different. There, it wasn't in partnership. The, the third person in the room between my son and myself was these sets of ideas that I never even agreed to. They were a set of ideas that were given to me uh, without my permission. Like I didn't consent to agree to that kind of belief system. It just happened to be how I was indoctr indoctrinated into the culture around me. And that was part of my um, you know, foundational beliefs. So yeah, interesting. It's a, all this stuff is super interesting to unpack. I know there's some comments. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just looking. Yeah, so Anastasia actually has a really big question, and actually, it's a, it's a whole other. Like, I don't think we've got time to cover it in depth now. But Anastasia, I'll message you after. This is the question: Can you offer some suggestions for parents who are struggling to provide the space for their children's autonomy because they're triggered on a nervous system level? Um, and then about the tools, how do we really support parents to support their children to have that sovereignty when they're rubbing up against each other? Yeah, it can feel unsafe. Yeah, it's in the body's systems. I mean, I guess to, to give a short answer to that question than it really deserves, just, you know, we've noticed if we make these videos too long, people get bored. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, Sarah and I never but, plan. We never yeah. plan what we're going to talk about. We, we just talk. talk. <laughs> hours. So, Anastasia, what I would say is that what you're talking about is completely, it's not unusual. It's really normal. And it's the biggest reason parents control their children because that feeling, that feeling of your nerve, you know, being right in your sort of like, you know, <laughs> reptilian brain and, uh, Oh, yeah, everyone can see you. You're going to be on YouTube, mate. <laughs> Hi! Um, that, the, the triggers, the react, you know, that is that is not only your body's reaction, it's more than likely thousands of years of programming. It's hey. your ancestors' reaction. It's not even just your mum or your dad. It's their mum and dad and their mum and dad and their mum and dad. It's um, And that's big. That's big. So it's not even just like your nervous system. I mean, that's how it manifests. That's how it feels like it manifests. But that is really the work of the, the deprogramming and the work on um, it's layers and layers of, of triggers and pain that you've stored in your body and trauma on trauma on trauma on trauma, more than likely over thousands of years. And it is real. And that's why we want to stop that from hurting by punishing our kids and telling them to go away and stopping them from being autonomous because it's hard and I am going to message you Anastasia for sure what what I what Lainey and I are so passionate about right and this is just becoming so much more clear right now is that our children are sent to us for exactly this reason yeah and it's not a coincidence that there are probably millions of children 
that have been born in the last 20, 25 years who are actually bringing this shit up to the surface like right now. Yeah. It's not an accident. And that's what I hold on to. Like there are some techniques and strategies, 100%. But like in that moment when I'm like, feel like I'm going to have a meltdown myself, I actually just tap into this place of like, thank you for sending these children right now because our children aren't just healing our family but it's like amplified across the whole world yeah and i would add that there is in addition to a psychological and and habitual response there is a biological response for that and the human brain um the lymphatic system takes over it's your fight flight or freeze responses the um the prefrontal cortex goes offline the the you know the brain stem then is only getting the fight flight or freeze not the reasoning part i'm I, i'm 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 a huge fan of of uh, daniel siegel and i always use the hand model right which is why i'm doing this now but the brain i just stem, want you to know that my brain's way bigger than that I'm just <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> but the brain stem itself connects to the, the, you know, this is your nervous system. So if you're not getting the calming, reasoning, thinking effects of what's happening biologically with the prefrontal cortex, and that is offline, the lymphatic system is telling the uh, nervous system to respond. So as Sarah talks about, she talks about years and years and years of this kind of development in the human biology. Well, this is how we're wired. The teens that I work with, um, the very first thing that I do, and you could do this with younger kids too, is you can help them bring awareness to this process in their body and have dialogue about the feelings that are coming up before they get triggered, as they're getting triggered, and as they're calming down. And get them to point to the places in their body for younger kids where they're feeling it. And let's normalize this kind of conversation because the more that they become aware of how the biology is affecting their nervous system and the rest of their systems, that will help then prevent the you know to get to get really um, technical the myelination of of the the neurons that are firing in that pattern to create that pattern that is cemented not for life we've got plasticity but that is um, you know creating the 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 habit of thinking those thoughts in that situation and practicing that response we're going to we're going to help them especially at a young age to to be aware of these things as they're happening in their own body that's part of supporting their autonomy right by by giving them the dialogue and the awareness that all the stuff that's happening is normal natural and let's be aware of it and then as they get older we can help them repattern that into something that's that's you know noticing their triggers where's the responses how do we reprogram the triggers and all that stuff i didn't mean to get all biological but but like so it, sciencey it, so sciencey I know, but it makes sense i can barely when, understand it <laughs> but when you're thinking about what's going on inside of the brain it makes mm. sense the biology is is you know, um, directing, because the question was about the nervous system response. It's all connected. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really helpful to remind ourselves too that while we're doing the work of getting okay with all of this, and there's there are these processes and tools that Lainey and I use in our work, um, it's also really helpful to reflect on the fact that there are many people, and, and we are probably included in that number, who weren't allowed to feel any of those things. Mm -mm. And so these things that are coming up for us now are the product of the fact that we repressed it for so long. And I, it is hard in the moment for sure, but I, I just want to go back to this idea of being really grateful for the opportunity we have now to do that work and do that healing because we're actually stopping that. 
we're stopping that pattern. Yeah. And that's mind blowing. Absolutely, absolutely. Ancestral wounds are stopping with this generation and we can make that so through our parenting. We can make that so even even in times of uncertainty and a crazy world around us, that's the best time. That's the best time to take a hold of your power and and create the empowerment within your family and heal. And you do that. You do that through connection. You do that through dialogue. And you do that through honoring the sovereignty of each individual, right? I, last thing that I want to say about like the brain, and I'm not going to go that deep, but when we are in fight, flight, or freeze, there's there's a fear. Fear from a psychology perspective um, makes us susceptible and vulnerable to suggestions. And we need to be able to see whether or not the suggestions from the world around us is something that we are going as a sovereign being to choose to take into our belief system and into our mental agreement that we're gonna we're gonna integrate that. But it, we have the power to say no, that this kind of fear and conditioning is not acceptable. I do not wish to take in, um, you know, ideas that are, are impeding on my sovereignty and my sovereignty of thought and my sovereignty of belief system. I do not wish to take that in. I, as Sarah has in her top uh, uh, cover, I do not consent to that. And it all goes back to, again, healing those wounds by taking our power back. So, yeah. <laughs> That's it. There's nothing else That's to it. say. <laughs> so, you know, next time your kid says, no, I do not want to brush my teeth, celebrate it. <laughs> okay. Because they're not taking on our belief systems. Right. Right. <laughs> On that note, wow. I've, I've, I have to take my kids to bed. So that's the that's the dialogue <laughs> at the end of our. <laughs> I'm not brushing my teeth. I only do it every second day now. Says PK first nights. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. Thank you thank so you. much, guys. Those of you that tuned in, and um, we will uh, we'll talk to you again soon.